Welcome, ladies, gents, and in-betweeners to the I've Seen It Once review show. Theme song! The show where Alana sees... Ta-da! Watches something once and puts all her feels and responses into a special review just for you. And everybody else, too. I'm Alana Sees, and I'm here to give you my first impressions and sort of in-depth analysis of Disney's newest animated short film, Paper Man. Paper Man is the short that opened with Wreck-It Ralph in theaters, and even though it comes from Disney Animation Studios and not Pixar, you can definitely see the hands of Pixar involved in it. <coughs> Lasseter. And as such, it follows what is usually the Pixar tradition, pairing new animation styles with short films with opening features. And this is in fact Disney Animation's first short film feature film pairing since the early 90s. Way to make a comeback there. In summary, it was moving, stylistically stunning, and really just the perfect combination of reality and whimsy. Although Wreck-It Ralph is certainly completely worth seeing on its own, the addition of seeing Paper Man alongside it enhances the worth of your ticket by, like, a lot. In fact, it would make pairing with a subpar film still worth paying for. Now, since I know some of you have not seen it yet, here's the brief, watered-down, spoiler-free version of the show. In true Disney tradition, Paper Man was dialogue-free and accompanied by a beautiful piece from Christoph Beck, who, just so we all know, also did the music for the musical episode of Buffy. Just... just saying. But unlike the cheesy feel of Once More With Feeling, Paper Man had more of a black and white, hipster reality, old souls, young bodies kind of deal going on. If I had to liken it to anything, it'd be 500 Days of Summer, actually. And in fact, there were several things that directly evoked the feel and settings of that movie, but I'll get to that in the spoiler portion of the review. What I can tell you, spoiler avoiders, is to be impressed. Be very, very impressed that you are seeing something wholly new in Paper Man. When I first started discussing it with an animator friend of mine, I'd asked him how the gritty lines and grayscale paint shading look had been done, because although the effects and things were screaming Adobe Flash to me, the barely there dimensional feel and the crowd flocking shots done with lots of individual pieces of paper going around all at once, they had to have been done computer animation. Turns out, there was just this intern who was working in the tech department at Disney who heard a few guys talking about making the short at lunch. The guys were agreeing about how they didn't necessarily want to do 2D animation, but they also didn't want to do 3D animation, they wanted something in between. Which didn't exist. So, the tech department intern is all like, Hey, I can write a program to do that. No big deal. And he did! Not only was this guy just an intern, which by the way means he has no rights to the program he made, Disney owns it all, but he literally just invented an entirely new style of animation, plus the technology that goes along with it. What? It's called Final Line Advection, and it's essentially laying down a 2D image on top of a 3D blank mannequin. You can move the 3D mannequin and the 2D image just adheres to it, which eliminates things like creating hairs and clothing because the 2D image just clings and follows the 3D mannequin around, automatically drawing the intermediate frames. This makes like a million things possible that weren't before, and like a trillion things easier than they were to do before. I don't even know the name of this intern, but if you're watching, marry me. Goodness. Hey, speaking of goodness, Paper Man is a story of boy meets girl, girl has red lips, paper airplanes bring them together. It's a classic. It's set in 1940s Manhattan, which is evidenced by the cars, the state of dress, and the office space that George, the main character, works in. George begins a short film at a train station holding a bunch of papers, and he meets a lovely girl named Meg, who smiles at him as they both wait for trains to take them to their respective places of work. After a delightful mishap in which a piece of paper flies into Meg's face, catching the perfect imprint of her lips upon it. The only bit of color in this grayscale world. Meg disappears on a train, and George is left looking longingly after her, wondering what might have been. At his workplace, which looks astonishingly similar to the greeting card offices of 500 Days of Summer, 
George spots Meg interviewing at the offices across the street from him through his building window, and acts as unreasonably love-struck as Joseph Gordon Levitt did. He uses his work papers to make paper airplanes, easily 50 of them at least. He sends them soaring and plummeting in her general direction, never quite catching her attention but coming oh so close. And he ends up dropping the last airplane made from his last piece of paper, the one with her lipstick on it. And though his boss makes it clear that his job is on the line, George pursues Meg, fleeing the building and chasing her as she leaves her building. He just misses her though, and so he picks up that last fallen paper airplane and hurls it away from him, resigned to never seeing Meg again and dying alone. Also, he probably lost his job. Paper soars across the city, coming to rest in an alley where it seems all the other airplanes have landed, caught in the breeze. Then, magic happens. Everyone in the audience starts to cry, because the paper airplanes spontaneously leap up of their own volition, go find George together, they're curling around him and shoving him up stairs and down across streets and onto a train and back to where he started his morning. Meanwhile, the last paper airplane has gone off in search of Meg, it finds her and she chases it back to that same train station. Meg and George lock eyes, smile, and then go share a cup of coffee. The end! It was only seven minutes long. I know I've already remarked upon how stellar the new type of animation is, but let me make it totally clear. The nuances involved in George's twiddling fingers when he's nervous, plus his errant hairs and Meg's wry, crooked grins, it was all just excellent acting. Just excellent. I also find it very interesting how live action this felt. Uh, the director of the piece had a really good quote where he talks about one of my favorite producers, John Lasseter of Pixar. He says that Lasseter always wants the audience to believe that that world is out there, somewhere. And I think, personally, that that goal is met. The world of this short film felt completely real, despite the fact that there were spontaneously sentient paper airplanes flying around. The world of the film was subtle, dimensional, and had a 40s sensibility that lent itself very well to the black and white vibe. Um, it was very well crafted and designed and supremely executed. In terms of story, I think that this short film is indicative of this new direction Disney's been taking where they want to keep the children who grew up with them. They're looking for emotive ways to keep an adult audience alongside the youthful appeal of their children's films, and I think it's working. This short was perfect for anyone in their 20s or early 30s or anyone who lived during the 40s decade. That's your older siblings, college kids, young parents, grandparents. Clever girl. The music was spectacular too, but then what else would you expect from a guy named Beck? There's really nothing truly bad about this short film, but there are a few almost not quite problems that probably are worth mentioning. Like, this was really cute, and yeah, I cried, but they had coffee. No promise of anything else. Just coffee. They might have hated each other, or never gone out again, or spoken different languages. There were no marriage photos, this wasn't a guaranteed happily ever after. And George definitely lost his job. So now he's unemployed on a potential one-time-only coffee date with a woman who might only speak Russian and who, just between you and me, might be underage. I don't know, I'm just saying, she looks pretty young. Also, George's nose was huge. How many more huge-nosed characters are we going to need from Pixar and Disney? Are we good? Do we need more large noses? Can we like focus on ears now or something? I also think that, well, it's really cool that in a lot of ways this evoked 500 Days of Summer, I wonder if it didn't come a bit too close. In fact, I think the character of George is set up to experience many of the same problems that Tom did in that movie. Meg kind of did just flirt with him and then ditch him right from the beginning and he still chased after her. I think it was beautiful and lovely, but in no way practical. And unfortunately, I can't say that I believe Meg and George will last. However, I don't think that that's the point of the short at all. And the lack of a secure happily ever after in no way discounts the greatness of this short, and in fact probably makes it more compelling. So if you haven't seen it, go see it. And if you have, go see it again. I will. 
And that's it for this episode of the I've Seen It Once Review Show. Coming soon on the I've Seen It Once Review Show. A super special oldie review of the 80s era movie Red Dawn. Plus, an equally stirring review of the just released remake Red Dawn. Are you ready? I'm Alana Sees, and you've just seen a That Role production. You're awesome!